said years ago uh, when the story ain't came to talk to your dad when he talked to you? Oh, Brent Glass, uh, Dr. Brent Glass, yes, he was working with the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at the time, and they were going around the state uh, trying to get put together some stories on the textile industry and the, the era of the strikes and everything. And he was interviewing my father um, on the history of textiles, and one of the subjects that came up was the 1929 strike in Gastonia that is rather famous. And he seemed to think that uh, my father just froze up or, or didn't want to talk about it at the time. And Dad was rather elderly then, and so we just let it pass. And I don't really think that he was trying to avoid anything. I think he was probably tired. And uh, it was also a subject that, uh, that, you know, that they just did not like to discuss at that time. So uh, later, Dr. Glass called me and asked if I would uh, do the interview without him there, feeling that my father would be much more open in discussing the matter. And so I said that I would, and uh, uh, Dad was delighted to, uh, to do it, and we had a nice interview, but uh, he did. He was more comfortable, and uh, he opened up on talking about the subject, but you could still tell that it was a, it was a sensitive matter, not sensitive in the, uh, in, in the context that they were, had done anything wrong or that it was, uh, you know, that he felt guilty on anything. It was just a sense of a subject that was, that had become, you know, hard for the community. It was, it reflected on the community. I think that's what it is, that, uh, that they did, it was something that was negative to the industry and negative to the community, and that was probably the reason that no one, including my father, liked to talk about it much. Uh, all of that said and done, he did talk about it some, and uh, was right interesting things that uh, came out, and I think some of them we discussed, and. Uh, This, this point on, I don't know exactly what text we want to take about it, but we had a very nice conversation on the 1929 textile strike. And what about the, you, and what about the 1934 strike? Was that something that was painful for, for your father, too? Well, I don't think they preferred to, you know, to uh, go back on it. They were trying to think of the future and not the past, not that they were trying to... Uh, hide anything, but uh, it was just a subject that no one in the industry, workers or management, cared to talk about because it was something, you know, there were deaths involved, there was violence involved, there were people that were hurt, uh, both workers, mills, mill owners, and it was something that they would rather let go of and let it be in the past than to um, just carry on about it. But, uh, you know, the facts are there. Uh, I, th I think the real thing they felt was that they wanted to look to the future. They did not want to look to the past. It was, it was not a subject that you would go out for a uh, public relations uh, meeting on and discuss bad things that happened, so they just like to put that behind them and go on with something better. Uh, they felt positive about what they had done, they felt positive about the industry, they felt positive about the direction of the industry, and those incidents like the 1929 strike at the Low Rail Ray Mill, they just preferred to, to let be buried. And why are you interested in the 1934 strike? I mean, why, why is it that you're willing to talk about it? It, I'm very interested in the history of the southern textile industry and have done considerable research on it, and I'm writing a book at the present time, and this is just part of what my interest is. I'm an, not an expert on the 1934 strike by any means, but I do know some about it, and I'm delighted to share it with, with anyone if, if it's of interest to them. Well, it's certainly of interest to us. So, you know, I... Can 
we talk about unionism in 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 textiles and and in location based learning? Certainly, Judith. Um, the thirty four strike, I think, is what you are particularly interested in, and I do know something about it. But I think we need a little background before we get to the thirty four strike and. Uh, that background is the 1929 strike, which for some reason has become the one that is the most uh, widely known and the most has been written about it, uh, uh, the 29 strike at the Low Ray Mill. Uh, but that was a concentrated strike. It was a strike at one mill. There was a death there. The police chief was killed and one or two union organizers were killed. And I think this is the part that Gaston County citizens like to forget that it was it was something that that was very bad that happened for many many reasons uh, no one had control over those reasons but with that being said the that was only an isolated strike uh, there was another one I think at the uh, mill in Marion and one in a somewhere up in Tennessee at the time. There were three big strikes, but the low Ray got the, in Gastonia, got the most publicity. And we read about it all the time in our history books. You can't start school down here without it being in the grammar school books and uh, the state histories and everything. But that, again, was an isolated strike. The 1934 strike that came later was a much larger strike. It, as I understand it, it was the first nationwide strike that America had ever had. And uh, it was something like 600,000 textile workers, cotton, wool, uh, silk manufacturers, uh, knitters, all of the mills, not just in this section, but from New England to, um, to Alabama and Texas uh, were on strike. And before we get into the 34 strike, if I may, you know, the reasons were this was during the Depression. Things were very tough during the Depression. Uh, business was bad, workers were out of work uh, all over the country, not just in the textile business, but the textile business was particularly hard hit. And the recession, the depression in textiles began two to three years before the nationwide uh, depression. So things were bad in textiles in 1926, 1927, and 1928, and 1929. And then, of course, October 1929 is when the depression hit the country. So by 1933, the textile industry had been in a very serious recession. Uh, the world's greatest depression uh, by that time and people were angry, people were out of work, tempers were short uh, and so all of this led to what took place and what took place was the first nationwide strike in America's history and it occurred in one major industry, the textile industry, 600,000 people. Uh, give you a few of the details on it. Uh, to give you a few of the details on it, uh, the National Textile Workers Union, I believe I'm correct, and the American Federation of Labor called the nationwide strike. And it was to be on Labor Day, 1934. Uh, which was a Monday, I think it was September the 3rd, 1934. Uh, it started, and I can speak more to the situation in Gastonia, but it wasn't just happening in Gastonia. It was happening in Providence, Rhode Island. It was happening uh, in Lawrence and Lowell, Massachusetts. It was happening in South Carolina. It was happening in Georgia. It was happening in Alabama and all of the places. And uh, all of the workers were being... Uh, organized, they were being, uh, a lot of publicity went into it, the union was uh, uh, going all out to organize the uh, situation, uh, trying to get my thoughts together as to exactly how it, or how we think it started in Gastonia and Gaston County and, and North Carolina. Uh, the 
uh, union scheduled giant parades in every textile town in the Atlantic seaboard. And the purpose, of course, was to have speakers at these uh, to recruit people to join the unions. And, you know, I forget exactly what their demands were, but uh, part of it was uh, the stretch out system, as you know about the stretch out system, had been instituted in a number of the mills, particularly the larger mills, and particularly in the mills in New England. And uh, that what was about in, the south? in the south too. Uh, uh, yes, sir. The the stretch out system had been initiated in many of the mills, mostly the larger mills, and many of them in the north and and some of the larger mills in the south too. The smaller mills, as I understand it, did not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, use an official system like that, but. Yeah. No, it was the, uh, there was never anything, you know, while the, they tried to get more work out of the employees, uh, I don't know. I think that was a, that is a whole story that is different. I think mo mainly this was in the larger, more publicly owned mills. The smaller mills still, uh, it was a paternalistic, if you want to use that, it was a family-oriented type of business. Everybody knew each other. Uh, the worker, the superintendent, the mill treasurer, the mill president, uh, the owner, and everybody, and you know, they just tried to run the mill as well and as efficiently as they could, but there was no official stretch-out system in the smaller mills. The low-ray mill in Gastonia was the main one where this had been instituted. And the low ray mill at that time was owned by the Manville Jinx Company out of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And this was a large company. They had uh, like the Norris Mill and the Social Mills and several other big ones in New England. And at this time, those other mills, the New England mills, were taking tremendous losses and causing the company very strained financial problems. And part of the solution uh, was the mills that were maybe running better, like the low ray mill in Gastonia. They were trying to make up the difference by pushing the workers harder there to, uh, to produce more and uh, with, uh, to, to do more work with, on fewer hours, to have fewer people tending more machines. And, and this may have been it was, it was a management uh, uh, efficiency technique is, is basically what it was. It was called the Boudet, Boudet system in France, but to everyone in this part of the country, it was a stretch out. And uh, I think it got carried away, and particularly in the case of the Loray Mill. And uh, the workers put up such a cry uh, and protested so much about it. I think the management in Pawtucket finally realized that uh, maybe they had carried the situation too far and they recalled the superintendent. Now this was like 1928 to the best of my memory and, and before the big 1929 strike and they sent another superintendent but I think the damage had been done then. The uh, workers were in an uproar. Uh, management was trying to get by this situation uh, business was bad. I think, you know, there were workers that were out of work. And, and so much of this was because many, many workers were out of work. The, the main strikers, the main people who joined the union were the out of work people or the ones that were only working part time. And so that's when the, uh, uh, situation became critical at the low rate. Also, the, I mean, it was the organization. It was well organized by the unions. Communists were sent in. I think this was a well-known fact. Um, the communist newspaper, the Daily Worker, sent reporters down there. Uh, communists from New York arrived and, and anywhere else. So, I mean, it was a, uh, a communist-inspired strike at that time. I'm talking about now the 1929 strike. 
at the, at the Laurel Road, and that's a matter of history. But getting back to the 1934 strike, and using the 29 as a little background and, the, uh, and, and giving you the reasons that business was very, very poor and had been poor for four to six years in the textile industry, this is the atmosphere in which the 1934 strike occurred. And to give you some of the details, uh, at the um, 1934 general textile strike was spearheaded by the United Textile Workers Union and the American Federation of Labor. And it was very well organized. And in Gastonia, in particular, they started with a, a giant parade that met in the city that marched down the main streets and uh, to the city park where leaders from the Union and communist uh, leaders supposedly had come to speak to them, the purpose, of course, being to uh, try to interest them uh, into joining the Union and, uh, and getting their particular mills organized. Now, so many of these workers were not employed at that time. They were unemployed workers at the time because of the Depression. Most, uh, many of the mills in Gastonia and Gaston County were not running. Those that were running were only running two and maybe three days. There were only a handful of them that were running full time. And very fortunately, my father's mill, the Reagan Spinning Company, had orders sufficient that they ran full time uh, six days a week right through the Depression. So it was one of the mills that was running at that time. The tactics of the strikers on Labor Day 1934 was to close down all of the mills. This was the purpose of it, to close down all of the mills, not only in Gaston County, but throughout the country, until their demands were met, the demands being primarily shorter hours, um, uh, less work, more pay, the, the, the normal things that union people want. Uh, some of the details of the strike itself, uh, with the background in mind that many of the mills were not running anyway, was to, as I have already said, and I'm repeating myself a little bit, uh, to close the mills down. Well, after the parade, the Labor Day parade, they started going around the county to close the mills down. And before all of this had happened, I mean, we, the, the owners, the managers knew that the strike was coming. They knew that the uh, organizers were trying to organize. And they had made known through the newspaper and other medium and had talked with their workers that rather than have any trouble, any uh, possibility of violence, that they would close down that Labor Day and allow their people to go to the big Labor Day rally. And they asked their workers first. And they made it known that they would close. And those that voted uh, that they wanted to go to the rally were allowed to go to the rally. Uh, so many of the mills did not operate on that Labor Day. R Reagan Spinning Company w and about eight other Gastonia mills did operate only because they had business enough to run, which was very unusual. But they also asked their employees in advance, they polled them, do you want to close Labor Day. And at Reagan Spinning Company and several other mills, they said, no, we prefer to work. They were happy to have a job. All right, now that was Labor Day, Monday, September the 3rd. Now, I have a question. Okay. Was Labor Day generally, okay. I mean, was Labor Day okay. a day that, that anyone ever uh, no, no, honored okay. in North Carolina for working? Are we back in now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, excuse me. Uh, in the South, Labor Day uh, was not generally recognized as a holiday. I understand that in New England and some other places that it was recognized as a holiday. So this was something 
new in the South, and this was a holiday that uh, that owners were being asked to grant, and workers were asking them to grant it that had not been recognized as a holiday before, and so giving the background there. Do you but, think Gastonia had ever seen a parade like that? And if not, repeat my question. Not that I know of. I'm sure there must have been some type of parade, not on any scale like this during the 1929 strike. And here again, that was concentrated at one mill. How do you but, think you, your father and the others reacted to this, to even for, the, for their workers to ask if they could march on a parade like that and be part of this union festivity? I can't answer that completely. I've, I have never and I've, I've studied the matter, and I've listened very intently to my father. I, mean, I am a historian. I've never heard that you know they objected to them asking for it at all. Uh, and I think it was very clear in the paper that that was for Labor Day itself. And I will explain myself a little bit further. On that particular Labor Day, most all of the mills asked their employees uh, if they wanted to go to the parade and... If they did, they were allowed to. If they wanted to work and earn money and stay on the job, they were allowed to do that. Uh, now, the following day, and this is where the trouble began, is that uh, things were different. Uh, in Reagan Spinning Company, they ran on Labor Day, and they ran the following day, which was Tuesday, September the 4th. And uh, at this point, time the rally had already taken place downtown and the labor union officials had now uh, the headlines of the paper read labor union dares mills to run on Tuesday so this was the text you know labor uh, the labor day itself and to go to the meeting were one thing that uh, United Textile Workers Union wanted to close down now all of the mills for an extended period of time until all the demands were met and the mills that could run were not willing to do this uh, you know one day off that was fine but you know if they had business and their employees wanted to work uh, they were polled and they were allowed to work so in the case of Reagan Spinning Company and a number of other mills they ran also on Tuesday and the labor unions, this was their chance to, um, to do what they had come to Gastonia and to Gaston County, what they said they were coming for. So on Tuesday morning, they had made known through the newspapers that, uh, that they dared mills to run. And uh, so they started out very first thing on Tuesday morning, the purpose of closing down every mill in Gaston County. Now you've got to realize that this was during the Depression, and I know I'm repeating myself, but it's very important to understand this, that half the mills were not running anyway. So, you know, asking time off was no problem uh, for the mills to do. The other half were running mostly part-time, and a very few of the mills were running full-time. So that was the situation. So, but the mills that did start work on Tuesday morning were uh, they were hit by these groups of flying squadrons. They were roaming bands of of men and women that uh, were part of this organization, and they would go to the mills and literally close them down. That, without rambling too much to give some specific examples. On this Tuesday morning, they started at the three Hanover mills in South Gastonia. They went to the mill, and these mills were running. They went to the mills. They uh, came in groups of hundreds. They were in cars and trucks and uh, carrying sticks and uh, bats and things like this, and they broke the door down to the mill, entered the mill, the mill was running, uh, announced that they were shutting the mill down and they would go through the, the mills and uh, do some destruction. They would pull the switches. But anyway, they started at 9.30 on that morning at the three Hanover mills. They did 
they stopped those mails. Then at uh, about 10 or 10.30, they went to Threads Incorporated, which is out in West Gastonia. They did the same thing. At 11 o'clock, they reached the Reagan Spinning Company, which was further out of um, town, and I can s speak specifically to that. My father, Caldwell Reagan, ran the mills at that time. Uh, they produced comb, cotton yarns, and they knew the strikers were, as my father quoted in the paper, were on the warpath. And uh, but you know the mills were running, the workers wanted to to work that day, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the sequence of events. They were my father, the superintendent, Mr. Miller. Uh, the assistant superintendent, Mr. Mason, were all sitting in the office not knowing what was going to happen. They knew that things were going on, and I'm sure they must have been receiving telephone calls from other places at the time. But unknown to them, the um, hundreds of, of the flying squadrons hit the Reagan Spinning Company at 11 o'clock. They stormed the mill gate, came through the mill gate, did not announce themselves at the office uh, which they had been led to, uh, the management had been led to believe that they would come in and re request that the mill be closed. They went directly to the mill, entered the door, pulled the switches. They walked up and down the spinning frames, uh, tearing the cotton yarns out of the frames, uh, stopping the frames, doing minor damage. And of course, while this was happening, my father saw what was happening, saw the crowds coming into the mill grounds, and he went out to um, talk with him. It was a very dangerous situation, I understand. And, uh, but he went out to uh, talk with him. He was naturally very upset and very angry at the uh, time, and he said some pretty rough things to them, but the, the first, and none, nobody else in the mill followed him out. Uh, because it was a dangerous situation, but uh, he finally he, he got to the leaders of the union and finally got them, uh, got their ear, and he got on a platform at the mill and you know, said, I want to I talk to you uh, a minute. So he got their attention for a while, and he was very angry. At the time, he said everything that he had was tied up in this mill and that uh, they would have to go through him if they were going to destroy it, that he was not going to let them do that, he said. Uh, How do you think he said it in his own words? Oh, I, I, the, the newspaper. The newspaper again. Okay, where do you want me to start? I mean, I'm not, I, mean I, I don't know, I'm sure you know your daddy's voice, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Could you quote him? Or could you almost say, like, I could see my father said it like this oh, and I, put it in the first person? Oh, I can ah. see my father standing out there. He had a lot of gumption and a, and a lot of nerve. He was standing on a platform talking to 300 or 400 striking flying squadron people uh, who were coming across the lawn with baseball bats and sticks and who knows what, what else. But anyway, they stopped and they did listen. And uh, some of it was quoted in the, in the local papers and in the uh, Daily News Record, which is a trade publication in New York. And one of the things he said is that uh, it was a damnable outrage that something like this could happen in a civilized country. And he, of course, asked them, he said, well, you know, why didn't you come to the office and talk with us and tell us your demands and if they were within reason, I think the word that he used, if, if your demands were in reason, we were willing to treat with you, using the word treat. And uh, finally the leaders admitted that they should have done that, but that the strikers got out of control. And uh, anyway, their demands basically were to shut the mill down. They also demanded that the mill be shut down until the strike was over. Uh, my father would not agree to that at all. They said, I will shut the mill down right now. They said, give us time. And it's so typical of my dad. He was so neat and methodical and clean. He said, give us time to clean the mill up and to put it in condition before the workers go home. 
and they were allowed to do that. They gave them an hour, an hour and a half, or two hours or something to clean the mill up from the destruction that the strikers had done. And they closed the mill down for that day and an indefinite period, but he would not, and this was in the paper too, agree to close the mill for any length of time other than the moment that they were closing it. And uh, at the, another uh, interesting uh, event that took place while, and you have to visualize, these three or four hundred strikers were coming towards him was, uh, yeah, I have a picture right here that I don't know if the camera can see it. The, I'm assuming that one of the newspaper photographers and uh, I think even the Associated Press and a lot of the national news media had already come to Gastonia. This is a photograph of the flying squadrons in entering the Reagan Spinning Company uh, and somewhere close by was a cotton loading platform that my father stood on to talk with the workers and I don't know if we can see that good or not and huh. um, you know, could you um you know could you point to your dad and um certainly and I'm then pointing i mean don't get up i mean maybe you just sort of turn in your okay. hand and you could say sure. and that's my father and i could just imagine him okay. talking that's to these good. strikers you could even um, hold the picture in your other hand okay yeah, just like a one hand. I mean, just sort of, I mean, okay. make it, I know I'm directing you, but make I it know. natural. I mean, I, um, I imagine your father must have been completely outraged that these workers came in like that. Oh, I'll tell you a story. I have a firsthand experience on it, but this is my father behind me. I'm very proud of this portrait of him. Uh, for one reason, he was 83 years old when it was made, and uh, it's a good likeness of him, and I can just picture him now uh, the way he was that day in 1934 out talking to the strikers. And one interesting amusement that, uh, that I remember him telling me very vividly about was that one of the section hands by the name of Sid Black, who was called a bear because he was such a big, strong a uh, guy was unknown to my father at the time was standing right behind him with a 20-inch metal pipe in his hand. And afterwards, he told my father, he said, Mr. Reagan, if they had so much as touched you, said I would have busted the heads of as many as I could uh, before I had let them come through. So that's the dangerous situation that it was. And another story, Mr. Boris Brookshire of Charlotte, his brother was the mayor of Charlotte at one time. Anyway, they had a textile supply company, and Mr. Brookshire was at the Reagan calling, getting ready to call on the Reagan Spinning Company that morning when all of this took place. And he told me personally that this is exactly what happened, that he had never seen anyone as mad as my father uh, that morning, and very rightly because of uh, what was being done and the possibility of destruction of the mill and everything, and he, he verified that it was a very dangerous situation. And, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the mill was closed, as were others uh, that day, and uh, this was just the first day of, I don't know, 20 or 25 days that the strike took place, so it was just now beginning. And with the destruction of mill property and windows broken and doors broken and all of the uh, spindles thrown out on the floor and things like that, the mill owners immediately took means to protect their property. Several things were, were done. Uh, the first thing was that they uh, did things themselves. Uh, they hired in the case of Reagan Spinning Company, six or seven farmers in the area who are, as you know, a very independent, anti-union type of people, I think, in general. And these farmers had their own shotguns. Uh, my father took them downtown to the courthouse and the sheriff's office and had them deputized. Uh, right across from the courthouse the standard hardware was the place to go with ammunition so he along with he took personally 
took these men to the hardware and got them uh, ammunition for their guns. And at the time, many of the unemployed workers were standing in front of the um, courthouse, and they knew him and knew what was happening and everything, and they made all kind of uh, insulting comments and uh, you know, said a lot of bad things as they were going to have this done, but that didn't deter them. They had to protect, they wanted to protect their property, and so they were deputized and got ammunition, and these men uh, worked at the mill on, I think it was 12-hour shifts. There'd be two or three of them that would work for 12 hours, or maybe it was eight hours, I don't know. And they would stay at the mill to protect the mill property to be sure with their guns. And uh, not only were they in and around the mill, I know in particular that uh, the same boxcars, railroad boxcars that are, were used to bring cotton to the mill were rolled back on the uh, side tracks to the mills and they would stay inside and on top of the boxcars day and night <coughs> for the period of the strike to protect the mill. And I think most of the mills did this. There was one particular mill that I know my father mentioned in uh, Lincoln County, good friends and good customers of my father, that probably went a little overboard. They uh, supposedly mounted a machine gun on the roof of the mill. Uh, and uh, my, uh, probably with some prompting from the Southern Comb Yarn Spinners Association, which is the trade association, <coughs> they knew my father's close connection with this man, and they uh, asked him, they said, Kyle, would you mind calling this man and just suggesting to him that uh, this might not appear too good to have a machine gun on the roof. So Dad called this man and suggested that it might be a little overpowering and that the, uh, the, the public relations part of it was not good and the man agreed and the machine gun was taken down immediately and that mill used procedures very similar to Reagan Spinning Company and protecting their mill. It was, it was a little, little overpowering and of course by this time going a little further into the situation uh, the trade associations were involved in it, uh, the National Guard was called out to help protect mills, thousands of National Guardsmen were sent to places all over the state, the mill owners and the mill workers, the ones who were working asked the governor for protection where they could have their jobs back and go to work and earn some money. And so that was happening. The trade associations were beginning to get involved in it and to, uh, you know, and to negotiate. Um, i trying to think who uh, was head of, um, Arthur Wingett, I think, was head of the Comb Yarn Spinners Association. He was from Gastonia. And I remember my, my father uh, telling me that every few mornings they would have meetings in the boardroom of the old First National Bank uptown on Main Street. And all of the uh, uh, yarn spinners, uh, a representative from all of the yarn spinners would be there, and not just Gastonia, men like uh, Mr. I've heard him speak of Mr. George West and Mr. Burton Frierson from the Dixie Mercerizing Company in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then there were uh, people from all other parts that would come to Gastonia because that association represented the spinning mills in the entire South. And so they would discuss the matter of what to do. Uh, Mr. W.D. Anderson, I believe, was head of the uh, American Cotton Manufacturers Association. He took part in negotiating, I guess, with the union. And, uh, uh, and, as, and it was a national strike. Uh, the White House was consulted. Uh, one of the things that the Union tried very hard to do was to get Roosevelt to take a stand on the strike uh, in the form of, 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 of public support for feeding the strikers and, and uh, you know, helping them with their financial situations while the strike was going on. Uh, I 
think then and you as a historian will be better qualified to give the details on that but i think the white house tried to stay away from it at that time that uh, uh, they did not want to become the center of the focus for the strike and i remember so much of the newspaper was regarding uh, uh, working through harry hopkins who was uh, roosevelt's assistant and did, did a lot of that work but uh, to make a long story short, the government did not underwrite the strike, uh, the first nationwide strike in America's history, and that was partially responsible for them uh, finally having to give up after uh, 20 or 30 days of, of striking. Uh, and I'm sure on the other side, the, uh, uh, the mill owners made pleas to the governors of their various states, and those governors in turn talk with the congressmen and senators, and the senators talk with the president, and they were trying to keep the government from getting involved, whereas on the other side, the strikers and the unions were trying to get the government involved. But uh, the long and short of it is is that the government uh, did not un underwrite the strike, and they, they made that announcement. Uh, anyway, we were only up to about the second day of the strike, but this went on day after day, uh, riots broke out at mills. There were, and, and to show that this was much a bigger strike than the 1929, there were a number of deaths. I do not remember exactly how many, but there were like 10 or 12 or 15 deaths. Um, one or two were in Gaston County. Uh, several were at Bibb Manufacturing Company in Georgia. Um, others in Tennessee, other places in North Carolina, some around Hickory. Uh, but there were some, some very violent situations that were even more violent than what took place in Gastonia. And this went on day two and day three and day 10 and day 15. And uh, National Guardsmen were coming to some of, the, some of the mills to protect them, not only protect them, but to provide an environment where the workers could go back to work. And this was tried on several occasions. The workers, the National Guardsmen would come, the workers would go back to work, but they might be closed down again before that day was over. And uh, in some cases, there were two and 3,000 strikers thronging around a particular mill, all going back to what they had originally tried to do was to close the mills until their demands were met. But the, uh, uh, the management, would not agree to those demands. And uh, uh, I think another thing that's historically important and uh, maybe getting a little away from the situation is not only the 1929 strike, it started with the 1929 strike. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that is historically important about the 1934 strike probably starting with the 1929 strike, was the fact that the, they were not, the unions were not successful in unionizing the South. Uh, and that set a trend, a policy for the next 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, however many years it's been since then that uh, the South was not unionized. I may not be saying that exactly right, but the, but the trend was set at Gastonia and places like Gastonia. When the unions tried to organize it, uh, they were unsuccessful, and this created, and I think historians call it a trend against unionization in the South, which is, is carried forth to this day. There have been some exceptions, and some places have become unionized but primarily the southern textile mills and industry in general were not unionized, and a lot of it goes back to, to these events that we're, that we're discussing. Why do you think that's so? Uh, I ask that again. I'm, I mean, what? Why, why, do you think, why do you think that trend has been able to... Um, well I, th I th well, I think the historians say is because it didn't take hold at that time. 
that it was not successful. They were not successful in 1929. They were not successful in 1934. There were other minor attempts before and after that, and that each time they were not successful, and that in itself created the trend that uh, uh, the South was not unionized. Maybe to get into it deeper, I guess, I suppose, the workers themselves did not, want the union. They were, uh, for whatever reason, and I, I think we're really getting into a deep subject uh, there, is that uh, you know, maybe it's their background. They were, so many of the mill workers were very independent sort of people, and I, I can't speak for the other areas of the country, but I know uh, this area of North Carolina was primarily inhabited originally by Scotch-Irish, independent Scotch-Irish and German settlers uh, who were the first employees in the mills. Uh, and then as the textile industry grew in the South after the turn of the century, they had to have more employees. So from the mountains of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee came uh, many uh, their original heritage had been of the Scotch-Irish who had been very isolated in the uh, hills of, uh, of the Carolinas and Tennessee. And they came down the mountain to find jobs in the mills, some of the very first jobs they had. And we even going back to after the Civil War, uh, you know, how hard things were at that time, and they were just only too glad to uh, have a cash-paying job. Yeah, but anyway, I, I, I'm trying to get to the point that uh, that these were very independent type of people who did not accept charity, uh, who had no understanding or use for the unions. Uh, they were very pleased to have a job. They were very clannish type of people. I think they uh, enjoyed very much the mill community life. Uh, it was very similar to um, the mountain communities that they came from where everyone was family and friends. Uh, I know my father, in an interview with the Charlotte Observer one time on the closing of the Trenton Cotton Mill, which was another mill that he was associated with in Gastonia, when they sold the village, he was interviewed and he said that he could remember uh, hiring these families that came from the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee. And they needed the uh, the help in, in running the mills. But it was always a family. One wouldn't come. Uh, there was a mother and the father, and there was always a grandfather and a grandmother and uncles and aunts. The whole family had to come. And unless you would give, you know, there might be several good spooler hands or uh, twister hands or weavers in that family, but there were the, the grandpas and the grandma. If you didn't give them a job, also an easy job, they wouldn't come. So it was a it was a family type uh, situation in the mill village, just like it had been from the places where they came from in the mountains. And I think all of this ties in that they had no use for unions, uh, and they did not see where the union would help help them and so you ask me why did unionization not take root in the south and I think probably this is the root of it was the independent type of people they were trying to organize that uh, were not inclined to uh, to unionization uh, they may have uh, it gets into a subject that's deeper than I'm able to discuss they may have uh, even been a feeling that uh, their religion uh, was not uh, conducive to unionism. Uh, I, I can't answer that specifically. Uh, I can't give you any facts to do it, but I think their religion taught them the... Uh, I know my religion does. I'm Presbyterian. It's a self-work, it's a work ethic type of uh, uh, religious atmosphere and I think so many of the religions that were in the mountain areas whatever whether were Methodist or Baptist or or whatever had sort of that worth work ethic um, feeling even for the uh, uh, 
the lowest form of textile worker. They were very proud of their jobs. And uh, it wasn't such a bad heritage. It was a very, it was a very honest living for them, and they were good people. And I think this was important to them, and unionization was not important to them at that time. Do you, can we go back to when your father was deputizing? Um, oh, yes, that's an interesting story. Yeah. Well, did he tell you that? How did, did he tell you that? With, what kind of feelings? Well, it's a lot of these stories are interesting that I I am a historian and I all through ever, ever since I was a child I remembered these stories and I would write them down afterwards on little slips of paper and keep them and you know then 20 and 30 years later I wanted to put it into some form so I'd take these pieces of paper and uh, try to do some writing on it, and I'm writing a book, as I mentioned uh, now, and a lot of this is coming to light. But uh, And then I said, well, I don't want all of this to be just hearsay. Uh, I want to verify some of it. So I started years ago verifying so much of this through newspapers. And my, I spent hundreds of hours on microfilm machines and talking with other people and everything, and these stories that I were to was told many years ago came to light when I would see almost the same thing printed in a magazine or a newspaper. So I feel very comfortable that the uh, stories were accurate. Now, again, your question was, refresh my memory, your exact well, question my, of how they felt. Was, yeah, my question was how your father, you know, what, how do you feel about his, you know, had okay. guns over, and did, did he care if anybody saw him doing it? Did the media see? Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Uh, I don't know that it's the, the care is the word that, uh, you know, he would, he would prefer that the situation not be there at all. He was not at all a violent man. Uh, he was a very, very good man. He was very good, and I can tell you many instances with the employees at the mill that they liked very much working for him. He was a very fair man, but uh, he had a Scotch-Irish temper, and this was one of the times that, uh, that someone had potentially or possibly come to destroy his livelihood. Uh, everything he had was tied up in that mill, and uh, there were 200 workers that were depending on that mill for their livelihood. So, uh, yes, he was worked up about it, and uh, uh, I'm sure he uh, you know, had no hesitation about deputizing the uh, people to protect the mill. It was just a self-protection thing. He was not going out looking for trouble, but if it would come, uh, and, and the other mills were doing exactly the same thing, that uh, they were trying to protect their, their property. Oh, oh, yes. Nothing, nothing was said. Everybody knew that this was going on. I mean, that was one of the things. They wanted the strikers to know that the mills were being protected and that they were not welcome to come and destroy the property. I don't think it was any secret about it at all. I think everything was very, very open. And uh, my father and the other owners would be interviewed by the Gazette and the Charlotte Observer and the Daily News Record from time to time, and, and they would, would talk about these things. Now, how it was you know, communicated to the strikers, I don't know. The, uh, the superintendent of obviously had communication with the, all of the workers, and the workers had communication with the strikers, and the workers had communications with the uh, organizers, and, but, but everybody knew I mean, how the others felt. I don't think it was anything secret behind it. You had one side trying to unionize and the other side trying to stay independent. Now, how, could, could you talk some about the, the textile manufacturers and their relationship to the governor? I mean, you know, calling out the guard. Was it a close relationship that they had with local government or state government? Well, I'm, I'm sure. I don't think it's any closer than the workers would have. You... Uh, it's a very, you can do the same thing today. It's a very simple procedure as you call your, whoever, you can call the governor direct, you can call your congressman, you can call your mayor. I'm sure the, the mayor 
did whatever he was supposed to do. Probably if you had channels to go through that the, maybe the mill owner called uh, the mayor of the town. I think George Mason was the mayor of Gastonia at that town, and uh, Mr. Mason may have called uh, Governor Erringhouse, I believe, was the governor during that particular strike, and the governor would call whoever he did. I, th I think it was a chain of command. And well, initially, and one I left out was that workers ask management to uh, get some help for them to come in and, and work at their jobs safely without being, uh, uh, you know, without feeling that they were endangering themselves or their family. And, the, and here again, these were the workers that were working. Uh, there, there was also, this is during the Depression, and so many of the workers were not working. The main strikers were the non-working people, the people that did not have jobs, the people who were without jobs. They were going to the mills that were running and trying to close them down and put people out of work. What if some of them weren't working? I mean, what, what if some of them were working? and they had worked all the way through, but they'd actually organized unions because they had that right under Section 7A. Would that, would that right. flip things a little? Uh, let me have the question again. And well, I, don't, I'm just, I, I was under the impression that a number of these workers right. were actually working and had organized local unions some, and had done so for like a year and a half. Some were, some were, and particularly at the larger mills, and I can't speak for the other for the other mills, but most of the strikers were ones who were out of work. Certainly, there were some strikers at some mills that were trying to organize those mills. Uh, at the Reagan Spinning Company, and, and this was in the Gazette when the strike was over, as far as they knew, and my father made this statement from the very beginning and to the public media, there were no union members in Reagan Spinning Company, not one. And the, uh, when, when the mill resumed operation, have a week later, or 10 days later, or whatever it was, every one of those workers were back at work. There was no union at Reagan Spinning Company. There was no stretch out system at Reagan Spinning Company. There was no one on public welfare rolls. Uh, and here again, this is not helping your interview, there were some that were were like that, and I, and I can't speak to those situations. There were some union sympathizers at other mills where the majority did not want to be unionized, but there was a minority that wanted to be unionized, and I think part of that was what the whole strike was was about that it did not take hold. The minority never became the majority of the, uh, uh, of the male workers that were strong enough to, uh, to get a union organized in that particular company.